Welcome back to the Pacific Century, a Hoover Institution podcast on China, America, and the struggle for the 21st century. I am your host, Misha Oslin, and in this special pre-Christmas edition of the Pacific Century, I am really thrilled and honored to be joined by my colleague, Frank DeCutter. Uh, most of you who listen to the podcast know Frank and Frank's work, but for those of you who don't or who need a reminder, Frank is the Chair Professor of Humanities at the University of Hong Kong and, of course, a Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution. Uh, he was Professor of Modern History of China at the School of Oriental and African Studies, SOAS, in London, uh, received his PhD from the University of London, and has written, uh, written and published a dozen books that truly have changed the way we look at China, probably most notably for those in the audience, his People's Trilogy, including Mao's Great Famine, which won the 2011 BBC Samuel Johnson Prize uh, for nonfiction, uh, was also a book of the year by The Economist, The Independent, The Sunday Times, The London Evening Standard, and on. I could keep going, but that would take the whole podcast. Um, he also wrote in the trilogy, The Tragedy of Liberation, and uh, finally, the Cultural Revolution. Uh, but we are here to talk with Frank about his brand new book, China After Mao, The Rise of a Superpower. So, Frank, uh, welcome to the Pacific Century. Well, thank you for having me. It, it's really great to be able to, to talk with you. We don't get to do it enough, you being in Hong Kong and, and me being in uh, Washington, D.C. There are is obviously an enormous amount that's been going on in China, enormous amount of attention being paid to China. But let me start with a funeral, the funeral last week of Jiang Zemin. Um, those who read your book, China After Mao, might come away with thinking that the title just as easily could have been China Thanks to Jiang. Is that a fair assessment of your view of, of China during the 1980s and the 1990s? Who was Zhang and why was he so important? Should we have paid more attention to his passing? Um, well, I'm not sure we should have paid more attention to his passing. The man was a dictator, to put it in a nutshell. Um, he, he wasn't exactly a Mr. Democracy. He was uh, a ruthless, devoted Marxist-Leninist. Um, but I think what has happened is that a great deal of attention um, has been given to Deng Xiaoping, so-called architect of China's reform, which is an, a complete misnomer, of course, um, and, and less to Chiang Zemin, who's seen as a sort of intermediary figure, but he really is the key person who made the China we know today, and for a, a great many reasons. Um, I can give you a few, it's a very long list, you'd have to go back to, to the book. But first of all, in chronological order, so to speak, um, as you know, he's put in charge after some 200 tanks and 100,000 soldiers converge on Beijing to crush the population in 1989. Um, and he's the one who, right away in the summer of 1989, uh, revives the notion of peaceful evolution. Now, what is peaceful evolution? Um, you, um, as an American, may remember a man called uh, John uh, Foster Dulles, your Secretary of State, and he came up with the notion of peaceful evolution in 1957. What did it entail? It meant that the United States and other international institutions like the International Monetary Fund should help satellite, satellite, satellite states of the Soviet Union like Poland and Hungary in the hope that they would then somehow peacefully evolve um, with economic reform towards a democratic model. Now, as you know, on the 4th of June 1989, um, the democracy movement was crushed in Beijing, but that very same day in Poland, um, for the first time, under a red flag, the population voted a communist party out of power at the ballot box. In other words, Poland became a democracy. Hungary followed uh, very soon afterwards. Now, this 
is what horrified the leadership in Jiang Zemin in particular. Uh, to them, this was an illustration, Poland and Hungary becoming democracies in the summer of 1989 was a, a, a perfect illustration of what would happen if you would, if you weren't strong enough to resist this attempt by the so-called imperialist camp to infiltrate and subvert power through the concept of peaceful evolution. So that became uh, a top item on his agenda. And it remains there all the way through his 10 years in power and is with us to this very day, to this very day. Uh, the notion that there's a peaceful evolution that is a plot by imperialist powers to again subvert power, undermine um, and overthrow the Communist Party of China. So every time you have in the 1990s, someone like uh, Bill Clinton uh, or Kevin Rudd or uh, George Bush say uh, that with economic reform, um, there will be a democratic transition in China. They're really offering Chiang Zemin and others um, all the evidence they need to realize that the imperialists really are very serious about undermining and overthrowing them. <laughs> but that to me is, this, is one of the key points there with Chiang Zemin 1989. But it, it goes on, it goes much further than that. Um, it, the, um, the, the China we know today economically, uh, for instance, the um, mergers and acquisitions that he launches precisely as the Asian crisis unfolds from 97 onwards in China, what he does he realizes, Jiang Zemin realizes that there are literally millions of state enterprises. Um, and the key, as far as he is concerned, is to merge a great many of them and create what he calls national champions, picked, of course, by bureaucrats in Beijing, um, who steer them towards great heights. In other words, giant conglomerations that can compete on the international state. And of course, the point is also that Jiang Zemin wants them listed abroad, not just in Hong Kong, but in New York, China Telecom is one. Uh, Huawei, you may have heard of it, is another one. Um, in effect, what this means is more power towards the state sector, not less. Um, but surely it is also the accession to the WTO in 2001, which is, which is absolutely crucial. Um, not everybody understands what happened at the time, um, but in, in effect, Jiang Zemin, others, Zhu Rongqi, uh, made pledges and promises about how the country, once it would join the WTO, would uh, follow the rule of law, would have greater transparency and governance, uh, would protect its like for property, would reform state enterprises, et cetera, et cetera. Um, none of that, of course, ever happened, but it sounded so good that the WTO allowed China to join without making its capital account convertible, without reforming its state enterprises, and without making its exchange rate um, uh, flexible. In, in other words, um, from that point onwards, um, the trade deficit uh, balloons, not just with the United States, uh, but also with Mexico. In fact, the entire WTO camp, not even Bangladesh is able to compete in the production of, of garments. Uh, why? Well, because Chiang Zemin is a committed Marxist Leninist. That he is a Leninist is clear that he has no desire to have any attempt at diluting the power and the monopoly over power of the Communist Party of China. No separation of powers, every leader has made that clear. But also Marxist in that he does, like all other leaders, really, uh, adhere to the principle, the Marxist principle, that the means of production should belong to the state. That is what was accomplished by Mao after 1949, take through great violence, uh, the land from the farmers, the banks from the bankers, the shops from the shopkeepers, and placed it in the hands of the state so that by 1956, um, all industry, all trade are functions of the state and the countryside farmers are um, really state employees. Um, so what, what are the means of production very quickly for those of you not versed in, uh, in Marxism? It's really everything that goes into the, 
in production, it's labor, it's land, it's capital, um, it's raw materials. So these are in the hands of the state of the 2000, uh, until 2001, of course, after 2001. So, so that joining WTO really is the point where China starts developing very rapidly economically. Uh, we tend to, to forget that China until the turn of the millennium wasn't really all that uh, different from economic from what it was 10, 20 years ago. If, if you take the, uh, the, the, the GDP per person, um, around about 2000, it's not exactly higher than it was in 1976 when Chairman Mao died, but that really makes a crucial difference. And there is so much more with Chiang Zemin. Also the attempt around about 2000 to make sure that every private enterprise actually has a party committee. <laughs> in, in other words, um, make sure that the private sector isn't really private anymore. This, this is, called, of course, very handy around about 2009. Of course, Chiang Zemin has, has stepped down, but around about 2009, uh, a great number of lawyers are arrested. And one way in which uh, lawyer firms can be held in check is, of course, because they too, as private enterprises, now have a party committee. Uh, and law firms that do not abide with the commands of the party committee simply have the license revolt. There's much greater grip, if you wish, on, on the private sector to the point that, as far as I'm concerned, from that onwards, roughly 2000 onwards, the whole distinction between so-called private and so-called public uh, becomes somewhat academic. So really. could, could I jump in there for, for a second? Well, first of all, I love this because this is one of those great podcast where I'm superfluous because you, you could just this could be a, a lecture that I, I hope on for a while I, everyone I, I, no no it's phenomenal and everyone should be taking notes but in terms of you know so I sit in Washington so we, we think about the policy elements of it um so first is the question of uh just just so that we're all clear I mean in your view the West you know, Washington really fundamentally misunderstood the concept of quote unquote reform and opening up that the the uh what dung you know what we attribute to dung uh and then followed on by Zhang in which we think was continuing essentially until Xi Jinping decided to cramp uh clamp down on things is 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 a misreading of history I mean you're a very careful student of history so hey, did yeah. we just get the big narrative wrong yes well you got pretty much everything wrong um <laughs> But, Not a huge surprise, right? <laughs> you got Deng wrong, you got Chiang wrong, you got Xi Jinping wrong, you got the People's Republic of China wrong, and you got the CCP wrong. Um, I would say start by reading the We have a perfect record. Yes. It's only, almost, yes. almost perfect. We're number one. Well, you know, the Canadians are worse. <laughs> this, this true we have to edit that out for our Toronto audience. <laughs> You can edit that one out. That's Trudeau Papa and Trudeau's son. Uh, we're completely wrong. I think what is important is to understand the central role that Chiang had uh, in shaping the China we know today. And from an even broader perspective, what matters is to understand that Xi Jinping merely continues what has been put in place uh, by his predecessor, predecessors, not only Chiang Zemin, but Prince Chiang Zemin mainly. The party cells are re in private firms are reinforced. The grip of the state uh, on the private sector is reinforced. The persecution of lawyers and, 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 and public culture is reinforced. The, the whole thing goes, much, goes, goes much, much further, but all the elements are in place. Xi Jinping is a difference um, of degree, not of kind. Xi Jinping has something that Chiang Zemin does not have. You've got to remember one thing, or you've got to remember many things, but one thing is very crucial here when we talk about the last 30, 40, 50 years, is that Mao Zedong did not quite destroy the Communist Party, but certainly subjected the organization of the Communist Party to to great assaults during the Cultural Revolution. He, he undermined it very thoroughly. He was so afraid that there might be party members, ordinary ones, 
or people all the way up to the top, Deng Xiaoping, Liu Shaoqi, possibly Zhou Enlai, who might be against him or turn against him, but he pretty much undermined the entire organization with the Cultural Revolution. So when you come out of the Cultural Revolution, when Mao dies, this is a very weak organization. It takes a very long time to rebuild itself and acquire some clout. So Xi Jinping can do what Chiang would have liked to do, but could not quite do. That's the difference. So the the um, the view then that, so there's a couple of views. One is that, of course, uh, and this is a one that's becoming increasingly popular in Washington now, is that, well, our, our problems with China can be summed up in two words, Xi Jinping. And if Xi Jinping goes, for whatever reason, removed or dies or whatever, things will go back to normal, meaning a normal where we know how to deal with the Communist Party. We've worked with these guys for 50 years and things will get stable. That's one view. Uh, there's another view uh, that this, uh, what some have called hard authoritarianism that that uh, marks uh, Xi Jinping really started in 2008 or so, again, as a, a complete break with that Deng Zhang period. Uh, again, both of these assessments in your view just don't match up with the evidence that you've seen, correct? Yeah, it's just all complete and utter nonsense. Um, Tell us what you really think, Frank. We did. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I spent 20 years in Britain, so I like to, to, to use that slight understated. <laughs> right. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> One hears a great deal of nonsense when it comes to China. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure which aspect of Deng seems cuddly. You know, is it when he has one campaign after the other against foreign culture and spiritual pollution and bourgeois liberalization? Or, or is it when he sends in tanks to crush his own people? Um, so Chiang Zemin, same story. Summer of 1989, peaceful evolution becomes a determined target for him. 1999, after the bombing of um, the Chinese um, embassy in, in Kosovo, he, uh, Belgrade, he, um, he points out that the Americans hate the People's Republic of China and says to the Standing Committee, says we must reinforce ourselves economically and militarily, but we must pretend that we are still friends. Mm -hmm. You must join the WTO, but not yield to their demands. Um, in fact, every statement by, made by every leader, including Zhao Ziyang, points out very clearly, public statements, that there will never be any separation of powers, that there is a camp out there called the imperialist camp, that the imperialist camp, which is you really, uh, is out to undermine the Communist Party of China. It's very consistent. It goes back, you know, when you want to understand the United States of America, America it's generally a good idea to read the Constitution. Um, and equally, it's a good idea to read the Constitution of the People's Republic of China. In there, there are four cardinal principles which were articulated by Deng Xiaoping and enshrined in the Constitution in 1982. What are they? Well, you could boil them down to two. Let me give you the four two words in fact. One is a stick, uphold the socialist path. In other words, stick to a socialist economy, which we've got to this very day. Uphold the leadership of the Communist Party, which we have to this day. Um, uphold the dictatorship of the proletariat. Now for readers or listeners who may think, what is the dictatorship of the proletariat? Well, it's the opposite of the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie, which is again, you and me and the entire bourgeois camp. Uh, and four, uphold Marxism, Leninism, Mao Zedong thought. So I think, in fact, you could reduce that to two words, Marxism, Leninism. This is the constitution and every leader repeats the fundamental importance of those four cardinal principles year in, year out. The last time I heard it was Xi Jinping in October 22 at the 20th Party Congress. So read the constitution. These are committed Marxist-Leninists. There's no going back. If Xi Jinping dies of a heart attack tomorrow morning, it'll be just another one. You'd need something much more thorough for this machine to move. This machine has gone through great trouble, including 
great violence to acquire the means of production that I just mentioned earlier on, and has a track record which isn't exactly an outstanding one when it comes to um, you know, embracing freedom and liberty. But it is not about to abandon what it has acquired and consolidated over some 60, 70 years. Xi Jinping, again, is a continuation of what we had. If anyone thought in the 1980s, in particular after 89, in the 90s, um, all the way up till 2008 or afterwards, that there was going to be a transition towards a democracy, then that person uh, deceived themselves and hasn't been reading simple things like the People's Daily in translation. Let me, let me ask you, why do you think we deceived ourselves? Why was it? It's, it's widespread. It's widespread. I think this is a difficult question because I'm not an American and I'm not a historian of the United States. Um, but I think it would be fair to say that it is hardly a misconception which is particular to the United States. The, the, the Germans, the Canadians, the Australians, just to name a few countries, were just about as deluded and there are many other ones in there too. Um, I think at heart is wishful thinking, but also a profound misconception uh, which is slightly racist, if you don't mind me using the term. When we say China, what comes to mind frequently is the notion of culture, a civilization, a tradition. When, in fact, what we're talking about with the People's Republic of China is not Chinese culture, it's an organization called the Communist Party of China. And its date of birth is really 1917 with the Bolshevik revolution under Lenin in 1917. So that's what you need to study. That's what we need to understand. Um, but all too frequently, um, the idea is that Chinese communists are Chinese. They're not really communists. So the Americans make this mistake on numerous occasions. Let me give you three examples. Before 1949, when Stalin um, helps Mao Zedong to transform his ragtag army guerrilla fighters into a formidable fighting machine during the Civil War from the end of the Second World War, 45 to 49, when the red flag goes up of the Forbidden City, the State Department continues to describe Mao and the communists as merely agrarian reformers, in fact, far more appealing than the nationalists in Chiang Kai-shek. Then, of course, um, well, Kissinger, Nixon, the rapprochement in 72. Um, again, Kissinger in particular, this is not a communist culture. This is a Confucian culture. Now, if you were to say confusing, I would probably agree to some extent. The idea that this is some sort of continuation of a Confucian tradition is of course completely bonkers. The extent to which Kissinger fooled himself or was fooled, uh, can be seen in an anecdote when he asked Zhou Enlai what he thought of the French Revolution. Of course, as you know, Zhou Enlai said, well, it's too soon to say. For Kissinger, this was this, this moment where he realized that the Chinese think in terms of centuries, you know, 1789, the French Revolution. Of course, Zhou Enlai had in mind the French student movement of 1968. <laughs> well, there you go. And yet, um, people have lived example. on that anecdote for 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 a half century now. <laughs> yes, it did. Oh, it's a good one. Signed uh, out on it. Oh yes, can't miss it. The third example is Bill Clinton, ninety four. Again, same story. Chinese communists are not really communist. If we help them economically, they will peacefully evolve towards a democracy. And of course, by saying so, he offers all the evidence that the regime needs in Beijing that indeed the Americans have in mind peaceful evolution and the undermining of the communist party of China. So <laughs> well, let, you could say, yes, worldviews that clash. Well, let me actually ask you at that point, it, it's an interesting question because there is a debate here over the um, 
uh, well, there's the reality of, of our, or the re, not the reality, the realism of our approach to China, but then also the effectiveness. And I, I, I wonder how you assess how effective this sort of counter-revolutionary, I'm sure that's what uh, the, the leaders in Beijing would say, policy and strategy was of the United States, meaning were they actually really worried about a counter-revolution? Were they really worried that this liberalization that you've just mentioned, uh, Bill Clinton, uh, among many others, indicated this peaceful, our concept of what peaceful evolution is, would be successful? Were they that that insecure or that worried about their own fragility? No, oh, you don't understand what revolution is. Chairman Mao said it very clearly. A mere spark will ignite the prairie. <laughs> in other words, revolution always starts somewhere in a dark corner where you don't expect it. Okay. So what they're doing is a classic understanding of revolution. The slightest hint of change must be nipped in the bud. You know, the merest hint at something that might undermine the monopoly of power uh, must be resisted at all cost. So it is not just that Chiang Zemin, to come, to come up with an example, wishes to fight quite literally Mickey Mouse. I think it's in 1995 or 96. He, he identifies Mickey Mouse as a target, wants to replace him with a, a local national symbol called Soccer Boy. It's not very successful, let me tell you that right away. But you might, you might laugh and think this is all funny, but whether there's Mickey Mouse or whether there are NGOs or whether there's the concept of separation of powers and the rule of law, all of this is seen to be one and the same thing. It is part and parcel of something that the Communist Party does not want. It's part of the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. And in China, we have a dictatorship of the proletariat. We don't want any of it. And if you allow the little bit to come in, the Mickey Mouse and the McDonald's, it might lead to the unraveling of the whole. We've seen How, this very recently in Hong Kong, by, by the way. Well, I was actually, I mean, if you want to talk about Hong Kong, that'd be great. I was actually going to ask just at this point, uh, your assessment, because we hear it a lot that uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, who, who just passed away this year, the unraveling of the Soviet Union and the fall of the Soviet Union uh, through uh, glasnost, you know, openness before the success of Perestroika, right, restructuring, really is a an abject, has been an abject lesson for the Chinese Communist Party on what not to do. Is, is that is that correct? Do they really focus on the fall of the Soviet Union and say, look, they let in McDonald's, they let in this idea that the people will have a voice uh, and they lost control of everything? No, I don't think so. It's appealing. I'm not saying that the, the collapse, the implosion of the Soviet Union in 1991 didn't have a great repercussions in the People's Republic of China. Until then, the slogan was, only socialism can save China. And the moment the Soviet Union implodes, the slogan becomes only China can save socialism. <laughs> so there is a change. They're but so the better than Madison Avenue. Avenue. They're just, they should get so much more capitalist money for these slogans. Brilliant. <laughs> That's right. What you got to remember is Deng Xiaoping all along in the 1980s, in 83, in 85, in 87, in 1989, uh, does all he can to fight what is referred to variously as spiritual pollution, namely foreign things and foreign ideas, bourgeois liberalization, which is foreign ideas and foreign things, um, or you know, opening up to, to foreign ideas. But the key architect, the key man who understood exactly what Dulles was saying in 1957, the key man who understood the danger of the notion of peaceful evolution is Mao Zedong himself. And part of the cultural revolution is, of course, to safeguard communist proletarian ideology against capitalist bourgeois ideas that might lead to bourgeois evolution. To, so to some extent, you could say Deng Xiaoping, Jiang Zemin, Xi Jinping are building on that concern that Mao identified and turned into a key component of the Cultural Revolution. 
they are continuing this cultural revolution, but in a very different guise, in a very different way. You haven't mentioned Hu Jintao, and I'm just wondering where he fits uh, in your view of these uh, defenders, essentially, of the revolution. Um, you know, he's, he's, of course, he's most no uh, notorious most recently for being manhandled out of the, the the closing session of the party congress uh i remember when he came to the yale campus uh circa you know, 2005 maybe i can't remember the exact year maybe six um and he you know he was uh often um derided or at least moder mo moderately derided i guess we could put it as being you know somewhat stiff not very effective as, as not quite a placeholder but again this idea that the the revolutionary impetus of the party was losing steam they were becoming technocrats they were becoming sort of you know the faceless bureaucrats and of course then that was all overturned with xi jinping how do you or is it even important to assess Hu Jintao within this schemata that you have laid out for us? Well, you mentioned 2008 earlier on, and I do think that's a key turning point. In fact, there are two key turning points under Hu Jintao. One is 2005, when things appeared to be going so well with the WTO that reform of state enterprises is put on ice pretty much forever. And reform of the banking system is also postponed pretty much forever. So you could say the end of reform, economic reform, if, if you want to call it reform, which is another discussion, is very much 2005. And in 2008, after the Olympics, um, what happens in New York, of course, Lehman Brothers, collapse, world crisis, that is Hu Jintao's moment. Mm -hmm. When hubris comes to the fore, and we're still suffering the consequences, Xi Jinping is the inheritor of that hubris. So what is the hubris? Well, Karl Marx, Uncle Karl, man with the big beard. What is Marxism? A philosophy that has been foretelling the imminent collapse of capitalism. Well, we're still waiting. But of course... <laughs> It will come. Don't worry, Frank. It's, it's on its way. <laughs> Don't patient. lose faith. You got to be patient. <laughs> if, if you if you are Marxist, then of course, seen from the perspective of Beijing, two thousand and eight is that moment where, at long last, well, you've been waiting for quite some time. At long last, the United States of America have unleashed a world crisis. This is. Finally, that moment that Marx had predicted. Capitalism goes down, and what goes up? Socialism. Hu Jintao goes around the world, Davos, lecturing all these leaders about how they're wrong with capitalism and how only socialism, with Chinese characteristics, can offer a way out. So hubris becomes important. And not just that, but a flood of money accumulated by fixing the exchange rate under the WTO, a flood of money released from the banks that goes not just to state enterprises, which was always the case, in particular under Chiang, Chiang Zemin, uh, but also a flood of money that goes towards increased security and surveillance with lawyers arrested in 2009, Liu Xiaobo, Nobel Prize, put away forever to, to die behind bars. And of course, in the wake of the Jasmine uh, Revolution, increased surveillance at every level, a crushing of popular culture, including TV shows. What's so dangerous about TV shows? Oh, well, you, you can use your telephone to vote for someone you like in, in a popular culture program. That's a form of voting, very dangerous. Well, that too is crushed by Hu Jintao. What am I trying to say? By, 19, by 2012, when Xi Jinping comes to the fore, China has been transformed into a thoroughly entrenched dictatorship with a sprawling security apparatus and the, the, the world's most uh, robust and sophisticated um, surveillance system. This, this, this is the China we know today. It is there already in 2012. 
And and we should note your book, China After Mao, ends in 2012. The last chapter, 2008 to 2012, is is entitled Hubris. Now there are there are. I, I want to get to uh, in a minute. I'd like to get your assessment of a uh, current Western, but particularly U.S. policy towards China. I'd like to ask you about Trump and Biden. But before that, there are there are other views of uh, where the country might have gone in the 1980s. Uh, or from the 1980s. Um, of course, there are views that Tiananmen was a uh, an aberration, a blip, uh, an overreaction by you know a, a party uh, leadership that was scared. Um, just to put the final nail in the coffin to make sure we understand, you don't see that at any point, or do you see that at any point there could have been a different path? And and within that, how important ideologically, intellectually, was Zhang's reformulation of the idea of peaceful coexistence, right? Meaning, you know, you could just sort of dismiss it that, well, you know, he said it and, and, uh, you know, but but how significant was this? Because it doesn't get nearly the attention that other phrases get. So was there another path that could have been taken in the 1980s? And if if not, then this reformulation of peaceful coexistence, how should we understand that within the context of Chinese Marxist-Leninist thought? The 1980s, could there have been a different path? Yet yeah, probably in cloud cuckoo land or fantasy land. Um, so what is this different path and who and how? Who would have taken it and how? How many leaders in the 1980s indicated some sort of preference towards separation of powers. I can't find any one. Zhao Ziyong made it crystal clear in red flag that there will never be separation of powers and there will never be a parliamentary system as they have in the imperialist camp. When he meets um, Honecker, head of the um, East Germany, 1987, he, he has an uncanny prediction Honecker says, well, you've got all this foreign stuff coming in, you know, all this, this pollution, spiritual pollution, this bourgeois liberalization. So Zhao Xian says, well, you know, in 20 or 30 years from now, when we have, when we will have increased the standards of living, ordinary people uh, will be convinced of the, superior, the superiority of socialism, and then we will decrease the scope for bourgeois liberalization even further. That's his vision. I'll say, well, it's pretty much where we are today. Who writes or says anything about the separation of powers? I think one man, one man, Bao Tong, a um, advisor of Zhao Ziyang, was pretty much zero importance, like most of his advisors. And let's say that Zhao Ziyang secretly would have harbored a plan that China should be transformed into a thriving democracy, how precisely would, it, would, would he have carried that out? Even Deng Xiaoping has to somehow deal with what are called the eight elders, eight elderly statesmen who are there, and all of them are extraordinarily conservative and continue to have a clout on the entire system well into the 1990s. And then, of course, they are replaced by younger ones. Wang Huning is one of them, by the way. Um, so, how would he have come up with a faction? How would he have built up an alliance? Where, you know, where is this alternative path? It's just a fantasy. It's not based on any evidence. As I said, read the Constitution, read the People's Daily, read what Zhao Ziyang said and wrote. If you tell me that Zhao Ziyang, after 1989, when he was placed under house arrest, change his mind, I would say, well, yes, he did. Absolutely. I could think too. And the, and the reformulation of peaceful coexistence, uh, again, you know, this is a little bit more of an intellectual history question, but you highlighted it earlier. I, I just want to return to it for a second because, mm -hmm. you know, there are intellectual turning points and it sounds like you believe that that was a key intellectual turning point. Is that, is that fair? 
That's fair, but you've got, to rem you've got to remember what I said too, namely that the first one to notice right away in 1957 when Dulles comes up with this notion is Mao Zedong himself and mm -hmm. he feeds it to the Cultural Revolution. And again, Deng Xiaoping time and again has his fight, his campaigns against things and ideas foreign. So it's a pretty determined approach by every single leader from Mao till C that there is something there that stinks and that's bourgeois ideology uh including of course the, the the whole political system of separation of powers these are committed leninists uh, and so is Charles the young by the way so let me uh since we're we we've gone for a while and though i i know i could keep going literally for hours on this and 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 would just like to sit and have you lecture i do want to ask a little bit about our the current policies uh, as you as you see them and i know you're you know you're an extraordinary historian you you focus on history but there is a there is a continuum uh and uh the continuum of us policy at least seems to have been disrupted circa 2017 with the trump administration i think there's a debate right now on where the biden administration is going and 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 how far um how do you assess where the United States, and if you if you wish to bring in some of the European allies, now sit with regard to China, are they more realistic? Have they figured it out? Uh, have they simply do they simply see it as a threat without still understanding what's really going on in its nature? You know, how do you, how not to say history is going to describe what's going to happen, but how do you feel we're doing in 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 maybe recapturing? some of the ground that we've lost, or are we not at all? Well, there's been a sea change. It, again, first of all, I'm no expert of um, the United States. Uh, and, and secondly, I'm not even an expert of contempor contemporary politics and, and the China of today. I really am a historian. I'm not China expert, but on the other hand, of course, everyone is, right? plenty of people who can't count to three in Mandarin who are China experts, so you should ask them. Um, I, I like to think that you should stick to the facts and to stuff you know, but you want just a general impression. I would say, of course, there's been a sea change and not just um, in the United States, but still so much incomprehension. As I said, read the constitution understand the four cardinal principles <laughs> read what these people say pick up a translation of the people's daily it's not something hugely complex and not only that but europeans americans have a very long tradition of dealing with regimes that come out of 1917. there was something called the cold war of course, it ended in Europe, it never ended here. We're still in the same Cold War, you know, the same number mm -hmm. or increased number of missiles from South Korea, North Korea, China, Taiwan. But the key point really is that there is an extraordinary reservoir of, of knowledge and insights and techniques on how to deal with communist uh, states, the Soviet Union. And it is as if all that knowledge and wisdom has just disappeared as, as if China is some sort of strange entity and we're trying to understand what it is. But it's crystal clear what it is. Just listen to what these leaders say themselves. They've made it abundantly clear time and again that they are a communist party devoted to a monopoly of a power and what they call upholding the socialist way. It's not exactly rocket science. So, yes, there's been a sea change, but then all these sterile debates, should we contain China? Should we trade with China? Well, go back and look at what we did with the Soviet Union. I mean, we all traded. The Europeans, the Americans traded in the 1930s, signing contracts both in Berlin and in Moscow. But plenty of entrepreneurs in Moscow in the 1930s, businessmen, were dazzled by the skyscrapers 
by that extraordinary enterprise called, you know, the Metro, that looked almost like something built for royalty. Uh, you know, the five-star restaurants, hotels, this and that. Now, now we're reproducing the same sort of narrative, you know, as if there is some sort of economic miracle that has happened in China that's been unfolding over the last two, three decades. There used to be entrepreneurs, American businessmen coming back from Siberia in the 1960s uh, and throwing their hands up in the air saying, oh God, how can you even complete, compete economically with the Soviet Union? Their system is superior. I've got the same thing today. So I don't understand what is so extraordinarily complicated about the entity called the People's Republic of China. It's the other way around. If you live in a system based on the separation of powers with you know, freedom of speech, a complex civil society, checks and balances that change all the time, you have an increasingly complex society just constantly trying to adjust to new challenges, technological, political, or otherwise, social, you name it. Because if you are in the Marxist Leninist state, the playbook is pretty much the same. I'm not saying it doesn't change. We've talked about change all along the last 50 minutes, 40 minutes or so. But, but fundamentally, it is a party which is trapped by its own playbook, by the four cardinal principles I announced earlier on. So if you understand that, then you know roughly what you're dealing with. Well, Frank, uh, we could, as I mentioned, we could go on and on. Uh, I think this is probably a good point to to um, wrap up this uh, this iteration of talking with you. But I, I I really hope we can do it again because you know your your insight into China is extraordinary. Um, we, we didn't even talk, though. Those who uh, look at the books you've written know about the extraordinarily precise and detailed research that you do in in archives that are not just in Beijing, but around the country that are local that reveal uh, the way that power is exercised uh, or or uh, or controlled, obviously, throughout the country. Um, I think for those, if and I mean this seriously, if, if, if you want to read four books on the People's Republic of China, you need to pick up Frank's four books. I mean, there's many more than Frank's, just four books that he's written, but the People's Trilogy and China After Mao, that brings you from 19, uh, 1945 to 2012. Uh, and and hopefully there will be then, uh, though I know it's increasingly difficult, a 2012 on volume at some point. It's, it's, it's much harder to do that. Of course, I'm a historian. I need a little bit of perspective. So I'll wait. We'll see who steps down first, me or the chap in Beijing. Well, I'm, I'm going to bet on him going before you. So do so, I. <laughs> good, good. Well, listen, Frank, again, it, it's just been wonderful. It's, it's, it's great to, uh, to talk with you again as, as a colleague and a wonderful colleague. Uh, I wish we could do it more and, and hopefully we'll, we'll have those opportunities. But I know that those listening uh, have gotten an incomparable an invaluable history lesson. So thank you for joining me today on The Pacific Century. Thanks for having me. So for The Pacific Century, I'm Misha Oslin, and enjoy your holidays. Uh, we'll be back soon, and thanks for listening. This podcast is a production of the Hoover Institution, where we advance ideas that define a free society and improve the human condition. For more information about our work or to listen to more of our podcast or watch our videos, please visit hoover.org.